All right, welcome back to our final session. We're actually going to loop back to some of the concepts we talked about this morning in terms of empire, um, because as an imperial specialist myself, empire is everywhere, always. <laughs> in terms of historical, historical causation, it's always an important part as well. So this afternoon we have two papers. Unfortunately, Lisa Hellman, who um, has contributed some maps to the wonderful exhibition, her maps are just in the back in the flat cases on the left. Um, she's a specialist of uh, masculinity in originally the Far East. She looked at Canton um, and uh, everyday life in Canton for the Europeans and the factories there. And then she switched to Central Asia and was going to talk to us about uh, mapping masculinities in that region. Fortunately, she's had some health problems and couldn't be here with us, but we wish her a speedy recovery. And if you want to look her up, it's Lisa Hellman. Her information is on the Ruderman website um, the, for the conference, the Ruderman conference at the Rumsey Map Center. Um, and she would also be happy to hear from anyone interested. And if you want to, um, I can give you her email. Then the speakers we do have here, we first we have Alison Posca, professor of history at the University of Mary Washington in Virginia. She is focused on researching women's lives in Spain and the Spanish Empire and has written several books on that topic. Most recently, um, her most recent book is Gendered Crossings, Women and Migration in the Spanish Empire, and she's also a very accomplished editor. And so she is going to start us off today. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for having me. Um, before I start, I have to confess, um, I'm not a cartographer. Um, and actually, before they asked me to give this talk, I hadn't even ever thought about maps before. Um, I study illiterate people, um, mostly women, mostly European peasant women. Um, however, recently I did write this book about the colonization of Patagonia and uh, the, the migration of women around the Atlantic world. And I am interested in the way that women moved through an ever more cartographically determined world and how early modern women understood space and place. Let me say too that as I begin to lay out my ideas today, about women and space and cartography, it became clear to me that my argument was going to be as much about race and class as it is about gender. To better understand the ways, so I'm going to tell you a bunch of stories. Um, to better understand the ways that early modern women moved in and out of cartographic space, I want to begin with the story of Francisca Diaz from Talavera de la Reina in central Spain. In 1560, Francisca left her husband behind traveled to Sevilla, and then made the transatlantic crossing to Mexico, where by her own account, she became a successful midwife. Six years later, she returned to Spain along with her black slave, Ana, possibly because her husband was, had died and she needed to collect her 15-year-old son, Andres. Soon after arriving back in Sevilla, she requested permission to return back to Mexico to marry off said son. She also wanted to take with her some merchandise worth 500 pesos, three persons who serve me, and the enslaved woman, Ana. Her second stay in Mexico also proved to be quite successful. At her death in around 1581, some of her relatives sought permission to travel from Talavera de la Reina to Mexico City to collect her belongings. She must have had enough to make it worth their while. So let's think about Francisca's experience. A married woman at approximately 40 years of age, only three to four decades after the Spanish conquest of Tenochtitlan, she travels alone from Talavera de la Reina, 530 miles south, uh, kilometers south to Sevilla. So there's Talavera de la Reina and there's Sevilla. She made the transatlantic crossing, probably stopping first at either Cartagena or Havana, and then on to Veracruz. She then went overland to Mexico City. Less than four years later, she made the journey back to Veracruz and Sevilla, and then retraced her journey back to Mexico. It's clear that on some level, Francisca's transatlantic voyages were determined by the cartography at the, of the time. However, the rest of her travels were made independently of the world of maps. For instance, although maps like this one existed for the Iberian Peninsula, Francisca did not need a map to travel from her home in Talavera de la Reina to Sevilla. Millions had, of people had traveled that route for centuries dating back at least to Roman times, if not earlier. 
During the next stage of her migration, from Sevilla to Veracruz, understanding of the Atlantic spaces and Atlantic cartography were still in their infancies. Thus, her voyage relied more on the accuracy of ship's, ship's captain's maritime skills than on any cartographic knowledge provided by rudimentary maps like this one. Once in Mexico, she would have traveled the routes of the Aztec Empire that were only just then being placed on European maps, thereby entering some combination of the indigenous and the European geographic and cartographic imaginary. More than her ability and will willingness to travel outside of the world of maps, however, is the understanding of the spaces of the Atlantic world that her travels reveal. Even so incredibly early in the colonial period, Francisca's movements demonstrate how connected Spain was to the Americas in the geographic imagination of ordinary Spaniards and the facility with which women could move to and from different points in the empire. Her multi-step migration from a small town in Spain to Mexico City, her return trip to Spain, and then her return back to Mexico was not an anomaly. Early modern populations around the Atlantic world were highly mobile, undertaking both short and long distance journeys, and displaying an understanding of places and routes that were only sometimes connected to the images created by map makers. Indeed, although the early modern period witnessed a remarkable expansion in cartographic knowledge, most women, and in fact most men, would never have even seen a map. Nevertheless, the journeys undertaken by free women like Francisca, both white women and women of color, and I have, a, I have examples of a number of women of color, free women of color who make the same kind of voyages um, during the first half of the, uh, the second half of the 16th century, were at points framed by the male cartographers who invented the Atlantic world in the process of attempting to rationalize and permanently identify the landscapes, cities, ports, and routes of Europe, Africa, and the Americas as they delineated the boundaries of European authority. It's noteworthy, however, that even, with, even Francisca's journey was not a product of mapping. Even though, sorry, it, her journey was not a product of mapping, she was not dissuaded by long distances, harsh travel conditions, both over land and three transatlantic crossings um, in the first 40, year, 40 to 50 years after, the tri uh, after transatlantic crossings begin or any sense, sense of social stigma about traveling without her husband. Francisca moved easily in and out of cartographic space, and Talavera de la Reina, Sevilla, Veracruz, and Mexico City were all available, desirable destinations for her and other women like her. Oh, wait. Yeah, let's do this one. For a different perspective, let's look at the migration of Inez Garcia. Inez was an indigenous woman from what had been transformed from, of the, from the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan and was, by the time she decided to leave it, the Spanish city of Mexico. In the wake of the political and economic displacement of the conquest, in the 1560s, Inez decided to migrate from Mexico City to the mining town of Zacatecas. to resell grain in that thriving city center. In making that journey, maps were without a doubt not a part of her migration experience. She would have traveled via routes created as a part of the economic and military expansion of the Aztec Empire, or maybe even before then, which were then adopted or adapted by the Spanish after the conquest of Tenochtitlan. If we look, if we look at maps created at the time, this one, created by a Spaniard um, um, of, of kind of the path up to Nueva Galicia. And this one, which is a Spanish map created on indigenous models. Uh, still in the 1560s, early modern European cartography had not replaced indigenous people's understandings of, and articulations of space and place. Rather, these early maps attempt to articulate indigenous geographies using this kind of vaguely European format. Um, however, despite these half-hearted attempts by both indigenous peoples and Spaniards to map the newly conquered spaces, by far and away, the majority of people in the Americas had no access to or contact with maps. Thus, when Inez made the 600-kilometer migration to Zacatecas, 
she did not use a map. Rather, she relied on indigenous geographic knowledge and indigenous wayfinding, which is the traditional ways that people orient themselves in physical space and navigate from place to place in worlds without maps, to get from one recently Europeanized city to the, nether, to the other. In this instance, European conquest did not radically alter indigenous routes, and women like Inez moved seamlessly in and out of both indigenous and European cartographically determined space. The itineraries of enslaved women remind us that, the, uh, that women's experiences of the cartographic spaces of the Atlantic world varied greatly. For enslaved women, more so than almost anyone else, the European cartographic imaginary that represented imperial control over territories and people vividly determined their relationship to space and place. Take, for instance, the journey of Mariana Angola, an enslaved woman who sought permission to marry an enslaved man Pedro Sanchez at the cathedral in Mexico City in 1640. Like millions of women, Mariana Angola had been taken out of her place of origin, which was probably just outside of the Congolese kingdom, uh, to a slaving port on the West African coast. And that's kind of what I wanted to show you um, on this map. Her native village, deemed inconsequential by imperial authorities, did not merit inclusion in the imaginary created by early modern cartographers, whose primary goal was to delineate centers of European political, economic, and cultural authority. Moreover, despite Mariana's geographic surname, Angola was not necessarily an indicator of where she was from. As historian uh, Trey Park Proctor and a number of others have noted, the majority of slaves exported from Luanda were called Angolas by Portuguese slave traders, even if they were from other ethnic and linguistic groups. And in fact, Europeans also used the, the surname Angola to refer to enslaved people taken from bays well to the north um, of the Zaire River. Thus, for enslaved people, surnames like Angola did not indicate connections to a particular place but were creations of enslavers, merchants, and colonial authorities on both sides of the ocean, set on erasing enslaved women's and men's identities as part of their subjection of the subjection of those identities to European imperial economic and political authority. Mariana probably made the Atlantic crossing on a Portuguese slave ship. Having survived the Middle Passage, the horrific Atlantic crossing that broke enslaved people both physically and mentally, if it did not kill them, Mariana first set foot on American soil at Veracruz, Mexico's major slaving port. From there, she was taken to Mexico City, moving her clearly into cartographic space, unlike many of her enslaved companions who were taken to faraway homes, ranchos, and plantations, which placed them again beyond the gaze of early modern cartographers. Women like Mariana were forcibly moved thousands of kilometers, yet neither their origins nor their final destinations nor large parts of their involuntary itineraries were evident on any map. In this way, Cartographers became secondary participants in the slave trade, obliterating enslaved women's connections to places both in Africa and the Americas in favor of a European imperial imaginary that articulated not the history and experience of Mariana and other Africans, but a newly expanded system of imperial dominance and control over people, territory, and geographic space. Certainly in the case of enslaved women, Cartographers and their maps had little to do with the experience of places or their understanding of their place in the world. Rather, European mapping practices erased African women's presence, choices, and perspectives. Finally, let's look at the late colonial itinerary of Josefa. In 1778, 13-year-old Josefa decided to leave her very tiny village, uh, fewer than 360 inhabitants, um, of Santa Eulalia Chamin on the Atlantic coast in Galicia. Um, and that's, that's all of this through here. Um, the Crown had issued an edict calling for volunteers to come to the port of La Coruña, from which they would be transported at the monarchy's expense to the Rio de la Plata now Argentina and Uruguay, 
um, as a part of an imperial project to colonize Patagonia. Although, by the way, they didn't tell any of the colonists that they were taking them to Patagonia. Like, that was never mentioned. Um, for reasons you'll see. Um, she, or her family on her behalf, made the decision to emigrate very quickly. Within two months of the edict, she left Chamin in the company of her uncle and his wife, his wife's mother, and their two young daughters, Josefa and Joaquina. After making the relatively short 17-kilometer journey up the coast, the family arrived in the bustling port of La Coruña, where Josefa spent a month or two waiting for their ship to leave. Finally, in December um, 1778, the family set sail for the Americas on the Nuestra Señora de los Dolores, along with 140 other colonizers. The Dolores was one of 13 ships of this part of this uh, Patagonian colonization scheme bound for the Rio de la Plata. Although two adults and three children died during the transatlantic journey, including Josefa's uncle's mother-in-law, it was a relatively easy crossing, and after approximately four months at sea, in early April 8, 1779, Josefa arrived safely at the port of Montevideo. Shortly after arriving in Montevideo, authorities decided to terminate the plans to colonize Patagonia, largely because there was a huge outbreak of scurvy, um, and the mutinous soldiers, uh, well, and there was all these soldiers' mutinies, they were the ones who were building these encampments, and it was just not working out. All this had indefinitely de the, delayed the construction of the outposts, so there was no use taking any people there. Unable to decide what to do with the colonists, authorities kept the family and the rest of the colonists in Montevideo for the next year and a half, during which time Josefa and her relations suffered greatly as the two girls, little girls died within two weeks of one another in January 1780. Eventually, Royal officials moved Josefa, along with her uncle and aunt, to the military outpost at Luján, just outside of Buenos Aires. The Crown hoped that the settlers would help to secure the contested territories beyond the capital against Portuguese incursions and bands of unconquered Indians. After remaining in Luján for a few years, Josefa then traveled back to Buenos Aires, where in 1786, at the age of 21, she married a man named Antonio Gomez. It's there that Josefa disappears from the historical record. As I noted in the talk with, about Francisca, with which I began this talk, the Iberian Peninsula was well mapped by the 16th century, and this 18th century map provides even more detail. However, and here you can see, so here is where Chamin is, and there is the port of La Coruña. Um, however, the beginnings of Josefa's transatlantic journey would not be even reflected even in this later map of the region. Rather, her route was determined by roads and paths in northwestern Spain that had been traveled by the ancient Celts. At least initially, here too, wayfinding, not cartography, led, Jose led Josefa from Chamin to La Coruña. Although this map might, could possibly show a, map, a route that she would have taken, What is more likely is that she was guided by the seashore, Galicia's rivers, and the crucifixes that are called cruceros um, that marked Galician crossroads. This is what guided her from the village of Chamin uh, to the port of La Coruña. Cartography most directly influenced Josefa's movements when the authorities decided to establish the settlements along the Patagonian coast. And it's interesting because this is a move that included both, the, 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 uh, both a mapping project um, of the region south of Buenos Aires, um, as far south um, as San Julian. Um, San Julian's way down here. San Julian is actually closer to Antarctica than it is to Buenos Aires. So we're talking about pretty far south. Um, so they're going to map it, and then they're going to claim this territory um, ostensibly as a strategic initiative against potential uh, English incursions in the region um, by simultaneously placing settlers in the region. When the scheme failed, um, as mapping delineated spaces but did not convey the inhospitable nature of the territory being mapped, 
Josefa and her family became a different part of the imperial mapping project. When authorities moved Josefa and her family to Luján, their bodies were intended to form the imagined border between colonized empire and unconquered territory. Finally, her move back to Buenos Aires probably brought her migration experience full circle as she returned to wayfinding to guide her travel. It's also important to remember, and you can see this really clearly um, on this map, the territory beyond the Fort at Luján was still a cartographic void um, as late as 1800. I mean, they had no idea what was out there. The cartographic imaginary of the Atlantic world visually emphasizes the distance between Europe, Africa, and the Americas. When one looks at a map, one is struck by the vast open space between the hemispheres. However, women's experiences of the Iberian Atlantic reveal a much closer relationship between places in the circumatlantic. All four of these absolutely, completely unremarkable women traveled far, really far, even by modern standards, belying any stereotype of women being required or, preferring, or even preferring to remain at home or even close to home. Moreover, there's nothing in the historical record to indicate either that they were exceptional or that the Iberian Atlantic world was not prepared for or indeed did not expect their really extended excursions. Early modern women's mobility was neither the product of early modern cartographic revolution, nor was it reflected in the maps produced by European cartographers. Historian Amy Stanley has noted in reference to global history that, and I quote, Pan the panoramic frame tends to render human agency invisible, unquote. Similarly, I want to argue that the European cartographic imagination with its global panoramic frame tends to render women's agency invisible. Only by moving beyond maps can we restore women and women's agency to the histories of migration, imperial expansion, and global movement. In that sense, and this actually ties really nicely with some what other people have said, thankfully, I was glad to hear it. Um, <laughs> I was a little worried. In that sense, like many scientific endeavors that are perceived to be gender neutral, early modern cartography was in fact gendered. Gendered male, racialized as white, and classed as middle and upper educated. That's who used maps. That's who knew what they were, that's who had access to them, and that's who used maps in the early modern period. The rest of the population, 17 to 90 percent of the population of the pre-modern Atlantic world, traveled through and understood the word, world in ways largely divorced from cartographic knowledge. Women went back and forth across the Atlantic, moved from city to city and region to region. They made homes and map and, and on both sides of the ocean, raised children, engaged in the economy, lived vibrant, mobile lives, no map necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Allison, for a non-mappy supposedly talk. I think you showed us more maps than anyone else has so far, <laughs> which we really appreciate. All right, and our final paper today is going to be from Michael Van. Uh, he's a professor of world history at Cal State Sacramento. His most recent book is actually a graphic history called The Great Hanoi Rat Race, Empire, Disease, and Modernity in French Colonial Vietnam. It's used extensively in teaching undergraduate courses and is a phenomenal book. I highly recommend tracking it down. And it's a pretty quick read, actually, because it's graphic, so <laughs> it works really well. He's a specialist in imperialism in Southeast Asia, and that's what he's going to be talking about today. Recently, his most recent research has turned to the Cold War in Southeastern, uh, sorry, Southeast Asian museums, a topic he would also be happy to talk about if people want um, to ask questions. But today, he's going to be talking about intimacy in cartography. Michael? Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for that nice introduction, and um, thank you so much for the organizers of this event. This is absolutely fabulous, and these facilities are incredible. Um, I do recognize I'm a guest here on this campus, and I'm going to say this very politely, but I think it something we need to say at uh, an event on cartography, gender, and sexuality, that uh, Stanford was the site of a very famous rape a few years ago, and I want to applaud 
the efforts of student activists and their faculty allies who've uh, been campaigning to have a marker there uh, uh, res uh, respecting uh, Chanel Miller's uh, wishes. And that's an ongoing campaign and I think something that intersects with some of the themes of this conference and definitely intersects with what I'm working on because it, uh, some of my work touches on uh, sexual violence. So before I start, um, I want to say that somehow I became kind of a cartographer. Um, I've been making maps and I didn't quite realize it. Um, I am flogging my new book um, and I'm actually going to pass it around. It is a graphic history where they took real research and put it into comic format. And I'm uh, passing it around here because it gave me the opportunity to work maps into the text. So um, I'll pass that around. You can take a few look, take a look at it. But today I'm going to be talking about a different project that I was working on um, prior to uh, to the rat uh, the rat hunt, and that's um, intimacy and cartography and trying to do a history of intimacy and in particular white male sexual intimacy in colonial Vietnam. So first, a few words on the demographic realities of colonial Vietnam or Landochine. There's a beautiful map on that wall over there of the French Union. Um, and in particular, in the city of Hanoi. So a couple of things you need to know about the demographics of Hanoi. Uh, first off is that um, the city was divided into three sections during the period of colonization. This is the older Vietnamese neighborhood that pre-exists the French that is more or less intact. They tore down the wooden buildings and required building in stone to prevent fire. Uh, but this is a neighborhood of 36 streets where about 95% of the population lives. Down here, this French neighborhood. Okay, recording. So uh, this neighborhood of 36 streets, about 95% uh, uh, of the population, the Asian population of the city, lives in this section. Down here, the French neighborhood, about 5% of the population lives there, the French population. So within the same city, you have this phenomenon of the colonial dual city, of dramatic differences on either side of this lake right here, in population density, in standards of living, in wealth, in urban infrastructure, and definitely in terms of racial demography. Another thing about Hanoi uh, demographics in this time period is that for the white population, it's overwhelmingly male. And this is the case throughout the whole colonial period. Relatively few French women made it to this colony as com uh, compared to French men. And it was uh, deemed not really a colony of settlement, not like Algeria or in the British Empire, Australia, New Zealand, these colonies of settlement. It was really a, sort of an outpost colony. So very small wh uh, white female population, especially in the period that I'm going to be talking about today, the 1890s. Up to about 1898, it's overwhelmingly, almost entirely male in the French population. Really, a f just a few dozen women out of several thousand men living there. That changes after 1898 for reasons I'll touch on in a second. Now, what were these guys up to in terms of their intimate lives and in terms of sexual practice? Um, possibly we could assume that they were all celibate saints and so forth, but probably not, especially as these are younger men in their 20s and 30s, early 40s, and uh, stationed in Hanoi uh, or settling in Hanoi for uh, several years at a time. And it, uh, it was difficult to find sources in the official archives about their sexual activity. And uh, it was this, this, by definition, Intimacy is something hidden from the archives, hidden from the observer. These are, they're doing things behind closed doors they don't want us to see. So how does a nosy historian like myself try and find what they were trying to hide from me? And as I was working on this project, um, uh, regu uh, regularly co uh, colleagues would tell me, oh, you need to really engage gender more seriously in your work. So confession time, I was a complete troglodyte. I didn't get it. At first, I was like, and I kept saying, well, how can I do gender history if it's all men? 
Okay, that was confession time. This is a safe space, right? I can, I can be, okay. So <laughs> then I got it. It's like, oh, gender is a social construction. How are they constructing gender in this overwhelmingly male, cisgendered uh, community? And how can I find sources to examine that? And so then I began to notice when I was supposed to be doing my real work in the, looking at the newspapers that there were all these cartoons and frequently they engaged all sorts of topics of sexuality. And one of the uh, common patterns in these cartoons that are produced in the Hanoi newspapers in the 1890s, uh, papers that would have a circulation of 100, 200 issues and would be circulated amongst a community of about 1,000 to 2,000 uh, French men, is that they would have these uh, cartoons that would have a bunch of different types of women and they would have some text alongside them. I apologize for the quality of some of these photographs. Uh, these were taken in the Hanoi National Library where the photographing policy kind of depends on who's working that day. And it's still uh, run by a bunch of Stalinists. So I was really afraid of the librarians. So, so uh, sometimes I would just take out my camera and, and take a quick photo. Um, so they, uh, these cartoons would have a theme. This is the priestesses of love. And there's different women. Here's a woman from uh, Hanoi, or no, here's a woman from Saigon, woman from Hanoi, uh, a peasant girl, uh, a French woman, uh, a Jewish prostitute who play a very important role in, uh, in the sexual lives of, uh, of the French community. And there'd always be, it was a, a theme and there'd be these sort of double entendres about uh, whatever the theme is. And I realized that these could be really great sources for writing this history of intimacy, this history of sexuality that wasn't making its way into the official archive. So I was supposed to be looking at official uh, reports in the newspapers, but I wound up reading the cartoons and then realized in the cartoons, I had this great source because these cartoons, they're difficult to work with, but they're really honest. Uh, so they're difficult to work with and they're locally produced and consumed. So there's lots of inside jokes. They're naming names, uh, sometimes names of, of businesses, and sometimes the caricatures, you can recognize who's being caricatured in there. So it's, it's a lot of inside humor. It's uh, part of private conversations. Uh, what President Trump would probably call locker room talk, right? Men speaking amongst themselves, not being observed by white women because they're not around. And uh, the sources could be rather frank and rather vulgar in this regard. Uh, the humor is difficult to work with because it takes quite some time to figure out what the joke is sometimes. And a few of these I spent a month or two trying to figure out what the, what the joke was, what the punchline was. But in order for humor to work, it has to have some resonance with the audience. So these are difficult sources, but I think really honest sources that are uh, sort of pulling the curtain aside on this life of intimacy, this history of intimacy that I couldn't find in the official documents. Uh, th this cartoon right here is actually from Saigon a few years later, and it's entitled The Good Boy. And they would use the English word boy to refer to a male domestic servant, servant regardless of his age. And so this is the good boy. He's sort of cowering at the French colonial man's feet. And in broken French, he's saying, uh, does Mr. want a congai or a mistress? I have a sister. She's totally new. So he's trying to pimp out his sister who he's proposing as a virgin. This is the, the kind of jokes that would be in the newspaper on a regular basis of guys making these jokes amongst themselves. Now, in the cartoons, I also found that there was um, this interesting moment where 1896, 1897, into 1898, there's lots and lots of these cartoons in the newspaper. Then suddenly in 1898, they stop. They're just not there. What happened? Well, what happened is in 1898, Hanoi was deemed to be, or chosen to be the capital of the new uh, French uh, Indo-Chinese Federation. And this is a dramatic shift for Hanoi because it goes from being this outpost city to now it's going to be the imperial capital of France and Asia. So what does that mean? Lots of civil servants are coming in. And these guys oftentimes are married, sometimes have children, 
Sometimes they bring their sisters, their aunts, their mothers, and so forth. So after 1898, you start to have the rise of a small but significant white female population. And suddenly, it's not okay to put these images into the newspaper. So it's this brief snapshot, this brief window where the sources uh, from this archive are speaking openly about uh, this kind of uh, sexual behavior. So as I began to poke into these various uh, uh, cartoons, I discovered that uh, almost every week in one of the newspapers, there'd be one of these uh, two-page spreads. Uh, this one's small apartments for rent, and it's making jokes about the different categories of women. And I'm going to come back to that theme, that there's this different categorization of women by ethnicity, and that uh, having uh, relevance to their sexual desirability. Um, this one is sort of how it's translated as sort of how they do it or how they give it up. And again, it talks about different categories of women, Vietnamese women, uh, different kinds of French women. Japanese women uh, are very, very important to this story, which I'll come back to in a few minutes. And so almost every week there'd be a cartoon like this that would be circulated around, uh, around Hanoi. And one of the other patterns that I saw in terms of the city is that that old quarter, those 36 streets where 95% of the population lives, was oftentimes exoticized and celebrated. Uh, in the official discourse, uh, the government sort of looks down on the old quarter as backwards, as in need of modernization, um, sort of Asian backwardsness, to use their, uh, their terminology. But what the sources show is that these, uh, these white men in, in Hanoi had a lot of fantasies about that part of the city. It was a, the most vibrant part of the city. There's unusual things to see going on there. Here's a couple of uh, uh, lion dances going on for Tet, or uh, dragon dances. You can see the, the dragon being uh, moved through the city. And it's full of people. They're very, it's a very vibrant part of the city. And it's also a place where French men can go to to hide, to do things that are not being observed by the colonial state or by other French men or by French women when they start to show up. Some more images of uh, vibrant Hanoi. And so they had this, um, this sort of uh, exoticized image, this romantic image of Hanoi. But oftentimes in their art, they would take the people out. So there's 95% of the population of the city lives here. But in the images they're creating, there, there's maybe one person there looming out of the shadows. But it, it's empty. And it's a site for these French men to project their fantasies and to also, I discovered, have their urban adventures. Because as they're exoticizing it, they're also eroticizing this part of Hanoi. And in many of the, the records um, that, I'm, that I was looking at, these unusual sources, they, uh, they gender the French neighborhood very male, orderly, big wide streets, so straight lines, where, uh, and, and right angles. Whereas the Vietnamese section is much more fluid, uh, the streets are more organic, it's confusing, it's irrational, and is oftentimes associated with the feminine. This is a poem, uh, it's a poem to a prostitute, and um, here you, uh, in the poem and in the image, this section of the city and the, the Vietnamese female who's sexually available become one. So she personifies this part of the city as a place where these men can exercise their racial and class privilege for their own adventures. Now, some of these cartoons were absolutely fantastic because it takes us on adventures around Hanoi. This is one of the first that I found. It's of fairly low artistic quality, and it's called... Uh, um, it, we, can tr we can translate it as uh, a bender or a rager, a, a big night out, and its result. And so you've got two French officers who decide they're going to go out and have a get real drunk and see what happens. So they, they go drinking. At one point, one officer suggests to the other, let's go see the girls. They go to a brothel. Later on, they wind up on the street. Uh, one guy's fallen over throwing up. He winds up in the brig. The other guy winds up in the infirmary, clearly having to attend to something that he picked up uh, 
at the brothel. And these are the kind of, kind of jocular humor about prostitution, the risks of STDs. Um, but it shows that this part of the city is a place to go and have a wild fun. But there could be some dangers. There could be some dangers. But it's all treated in this sort of frat boy, locker room, jocular attitude. This cartoon, uh, The Beautiful Tonkin Waz, The Beautiful Girl of Tonkin, is absolutely fantastic for mapping what the Frenchmen are up to in Hanoi, because he names names. He names names of streets. So in this, uh, in this story told in nine, uh, nine panels, uh, we meet our, uh, the narrator. Sorry, I'm trying to keep track of my time here. Uh, we meet our narrator who says that he was uh, depressed and sort of blue. Um, he, he's well-dressed here and obviously has a fair amount of economic power in the colonial setting, but there's something missing. He, wants, he, he needs some excitement in his life. And he sees the most famous prostitute in Hanoi walking by, and she's walking by a very important place. She's on Rue Paul Bear, which is the street that divides the French neighborhood from the Vietnamese neighborhood, the French quarter from the native quarter. And uh, he sees her, and he, start, he decides he's going to follow her. And so he, um, this adventure starts, well, I can show you a photograph where it starts. It starts right on the street corner here. And I can show you an aerial photograph of where that is. The adventure starts right here at this intersection of the heart of the French Quarter. And then as we go this way, we get into the Vietnamese Quarter. And we can put that on the map. So that would be the adventure starts right here. And he's going to go up into this direction, into this part of the city. The source is, is fantastic uh, for my purposes because as he follows her, he names the different street or hang. Uh, the word is H-A-N-G, and it's a, the name for these short streets of the old quarter. And in traditional uh, Hanoi history, each of these streets was devoted to a particular trade uh, or product. So there's a street of cotton, the street of sails, the street of rope, uh, the street of rice. It's like uh, medieval guilds, right? And so he follows her through these streets, and he names the streets. So we know where this kind of behavior is going on. And uh, he follows her through several panels. I should have put the slide in here where I have this mapped out. But takes us into this part of the city. Again, one third of the city where 95% of the population lives, but where a white man can go and not be seen by other white people, right? It's, uh, I have another piece where I call this the Chinatown phenomenon, sort of uh, echoing uh, Roman Polanski's Chinatown, where you go into Chinatown, it's a site of racial slumming. There's a great body of literature, literature on this about New York and London, Limehouse in London and uh, Harlem in New York, racial slumming as part of this uh, urban sexual adventures for these, uh, these men. So he goes on this adventure. Uh, he eventually winds up in a room, uh, room with her. She's wrapped around him. But uh-oh, problem arises. Her pimp shows up with a bamboo, uh, uh, bamboo cane. And unfortunately, our hero has given her counterfeit coins. On purpose or not, we don't know. But her pimp's furious. She's now looking for real money going through his clothes. And then uh, the, the Frenchman gets unceremoniously kicked out of, uh, of the trysting spot. And uh, um, he's actually getting kicked in the butt as he goes out. So it shows the way in which this section of the city, we can, we can actually map and start to name places in the city where this history of intimacy is happening. So this, this, for me, this is fabulous, because I, I knew these guys were up to something, right? <laughs> but now I've got the evidence from these cartoons that they're circulating amongst themselves, which again, I'm reading to have uh, a great deal of honesty because they're, they're part of these conversation, conversations amongst French men. So we can map this, uh, this history of intimacy and sexual behavior uh, around Hanoi, but then I began to find sources where we could pull back a bit and map this onto Asia as a whole. Um, so I mentioned previously that there's different ethnic groups of women here. 
and they're making different comments based on their ethnicity. And Japanese women get a lot of attention. And this was because in the 1890s is really the high point of this idea that J Japan was a site of sexual tourism. Um, this was the case up to about 1905, when after the Japanese win the uh, Russo-Japanese War, the Japanese government does its best to shake that image, to get rid of it. But in the 1890s, partially because it was um, too expensive to send um, uh, French men back to France uh, for rest, for R and R, for rest and relaxation, it'd be very common that they would go to Japan, and a whole industry, a sex industry, servicing foreigners, developed there. And in the minds of many of these guys that I'm studying, Japan becomes kind of like bad cliches of uh, sex tourism in Thailand today. You know, it's suspect when a single guy goes alone on a trip to Thailand, right? I mean, that's an eyebrow raiser. It's a punchline for major motion pictures in American culture, right? Japan occupies this role in this time period. And almost all of these sources I found, when it talks about Japan, always celebrates Japanese women as being the sort of elevated class of prostitute. There's white women at the very top, and then there's Japanese women. So they're the, the, the highest quality uh, woman that a Frenchman could buy in Asia. And again, this, this uh, desire is mapped on to the entire country. So here we've got French Indochina. And in their geographic imagination, this is a site of uh, sexual opportunity. And uh, in a number of the cartoons, they talk about, they make jokes about how great it was to get sick. Because if you get sick, you get sent on R&R, &R, and then you get to go to Japan. And wink, wink, nudge, nudge, to quote Monty Python. Um, I found another cartoon source that allowed me to extend this mapping throughout greater Southeast Asia and into the Indian Ocean. And this is a story of a Frenchman leaving Hanoi and making several stops, several ports of call, and uh, making reference to his sexual adventures in each of these. Uh, the cartoon puts um, Saigon at, uh, high on the list of places for uh, Frenchmen to have an adventure. There was a reputation amongst Frenchmen in Hanoi that the Vietnamese women of Saigon were much more beautiful, much more sophisticated, much more desirable than the women of Hanoi. The women of Hanoi were deemed as sort of peasant girls who that, you know, they maybe, you know, just a few years out of the rice fields or something. But there was this obsession with Saigon women as being much more sophisticated. And they chalk it up as to, due to a longer French presence in Saigon. That's sort of the main stereotype there. Uh, the main character moves down to Singapore. So he goes from... Uh, from Hanoi down to Saigon, down to Singapore. And in Singapore, which was famous for having uh, lots of Japanese run brothels, um, he's, uh, he's seen here bargaining with something but getting pulled away by a very aggressive Japanese uh, sex worker. And then as we move on, he stops in uh, Sri Lanka and in Colombo, has an adventure there. I'm sorry for the quality here. It must have been one of these days where one of the main Stalinist librarians was really trying to glare at me. But um, he's, uh, he's hooking up with a, a sex worker on a boat in the harbor, sort of giving clues to uh, the kinds of sexual adventures that you might find there, that something would happen in the port. And then interestingly, as he crosses the Indian Ocean and his ship stops in Djibouti, so here as we get into the Red Sea, he strikes out. Things have changed. He's out of Asia, which is sort of characterized as this land of sexual opportunity, and now he's in the Islamic world. So what do the women look like? They're here behind uh, full covering. So this is the end of his sexual adventure. And you can see his frustration, not just with the heat, but not getting what he was looking for. So this has been my project. Uh, uh, again, mapping this history that was hidden from me, trying to do it with unusual sources, mapping it not just in the, the cities I was looking at specifically, but these sources led me to uh, 
depict the ways in which uh, French men were understanding different groups of Asians and ranking them on this uh, hierarchy of sexual desirability. That's it. Thank you very much. So two papers that talked a lot about race, class, um, movement, and of course, gender and sexuality. I'm going to use chair's prerogative to ask the first question because uh, I can. Um, Michael, with yours, um, I agree that these cartoons uh, definitely show something that an official report weren't. So I agree with the, the honesty that you called it there. But I'm wondering to what degree that honest, what is the extent of that honesty? Uh, and the point of that, is, and what I mean by that is that these were all heterosexual acts. And I'm wondering if I don't doubt that there were also homosexual acts going on, and those don't seem to be allowed to be in these cartoons. So what degree are they honest sources, and in what degree are they not showing certain sexual acts and certain sexualities? Yeah. Um, so there's kind of a, a degree of honesty, but then maybe something that's not being shown to. Yeah, I mean, um, what you underlined is uh, an editorial decision on my behalf. There, are, I do have a few sources that do talk about same-sex um, uh, sort of same-sex predatory sexual activity. Um, my understanding, based upon looking through these sources, is that these are all produced by cisgendered men. Um, and when same-sex issues enter into these cartoons, it's normally to insult the French men in question. Or to, um, th this is France and after the Franco-Prussian War, or to insult Germany. So ab about this time, there was a major sex scandal in Germany, uh, the, uh, the Eulenburg scandal, and um, uh, a bunch of officers around the Kaiser were using uh, young male recruits as um, uh, sex workers. And it was this huge scandal, and it revealed all sorts of uh, mischief going on in the Kaiser's inner circle. So frequently, there'll be references to gay German sex, gay male on male German sex as a way to uh, to insult Germany and so forth. Um, there's a few instances where they're making fun of some older French guys, and for some reason, the um, the homophobic humor is oftentimes paired with an older man. I don't know quite up what quite what's up with that, but for the most part, these the the same sex cartoons really are in the minority. And they're just here and there, and it's not enough for me to really sort of map that or write that. Mm -hmm. But um, it is something that they are talking about. But um, it's again, it's always represented as sort of this homophobic joke, insulting somebody, insulting this one French guy, or insulting Germany. Great. So it seems like in addition to a racialized hierarchy, there is a sexualized hierarchy of, of sex acts that re re shows just how heteronormative, in addition to how <laughs> racist, yeah, yeah, these yeah. empires are. But I, I, I don't have enough to, to work this mm -hmm. into this the, the, today's argument about trying to, to map intimate behavior. Definitely. Do we have other? Of course. <laughs> so I was struck by something. and. It's the, it's the use of the word intimacy as a euphemism for sex. Um, it, I was just looking up definitions of the word intimacy, and there is, I found one note where it's listed as a euphemism, or um, a couple of other places where it's just defined as sexual contact. But primarily at top billing, it's more of a, it's an, it's an indicator of a positive thing, like a, a sort of a, a closeness or a close friendship or something that feels to be actually the opposite of what you're talking about. Not in all situations, certainly, but um, because I think there's actually quite a lot of it's very subjective, potentially. But well, so it's a strange thing. So why that yeah. word? Because yeah. I feel like so it's a convention <laughs> in the sorry in the in the sort of writ large in the history community. I, yeah, I got a very very clear practical answer to that because I was uh, asked to contribute something to a special j issue of the Journal of World History on intimacy and gender and empire, and um, uh, Tracy Rizzo, who organized that, was using intimacy in this regard to 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 look at hidden histories. That are primarily of a um, of a sexual nature, but Ann Stoller, for example, talks about intimacy in terms of domestic servants in the Dutch East Indies. Mm 
And um, any time that you're you're ha you're exploring this history that's going on behind closed doors, that is oftentimes something that they don't want us to see. It's a history of of what's going on in private, and that's that's how the team that put together the articles in that journal. That's how we used intimacy. So there's a spatialization there as well. More questions in the back, if something could. Chris, and then we'll go to Matthew after. Michael, sorry, we're going to keep <laughs> another question for you. So uh, ages ago, I did some work on the red light district in Butte, Montana. And one of the things that, that struck me was that for a period of time, the red light district, which was quite sizable, one of the biggest, I think, in the American West at one point, um, was tolerated by not only the businessmen, but also the women of the community because it provided a place for sex. That there was the, I don't want to say healthy, but a um, men would go there to have sex, and that's where sex belonged, and therefore their residential area was safe, as it were. So I'm wondering, in your work, You've, been, you've covered largely kind of media portrayals, mm -hmm. but is there a sense that this was tolerated by the colonial administration? Or, I mean, the women were a very small voice for a long period of time, but was this kind of tolerated because it was viewed as kind of a safe outlet? Yeah, ab absolutely, absolutely. That's, this kind of behavior can happen in that part of the city, and it's safe. That's, it's also where you go to smoke opium, uh, to get really drunk, uh, to gamble. All that kind of stuff can go on over there. It's not tolerated in the, uh, in the French neighborhoods. And um, the records, the official records I did see were on crackdowns on such businesses in, in the French neighborhood. So that, that this, is, this is a conscious decision. And I, f I found some documents earlier on in the French occupation of Hanoi when things are a bit more mixed. And one of them was the, um, the head of a, a music school who was really frustrated because behind his villa were a whole line of shacks where a lot of low rent prostitution was going on. And um, he, he wrote angry letters to, the, uh, to the, the mayor until eventually they cleared those out and, and pushed those into uh, this designated part of the city. But there, there, is, there is, at this time in France, there is this, the system of maison de tolerance, that ideally brothels are registered with the city, have health inspections, and um, uh, pay a special tax. And that comes online in Hanoi a few years after the time period I'm looking at. And then I can get some more official perspectives on this, uh, this, this history. Addison. I've got a question for you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so there's been some work uh, on the sort of very extensive um, infrastructure that allows uh, a lot of people to move around Europe in the medieval early modern period, you know, guides who would take groups of people from one town to the next on the, along the main roads or through passes, and then they'd take the next group going back, and they'd just go back and forth leading travelers. Um, so I'm just wondering, I mean, your, your, your narratives of, sorry, your, na your narrative of these very adventurous women um, presents them as, as working completely alone. And I'm wondering, are there, what kind of infrastructures have developed very early in this transatlantic period for all travelers, maybe women in, in particular, that they're, that they're tapping into in order to move, to be able to move, that's giving them direction as well as the capacity to, 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 to travel these long distances. So in my 16th century cases, there really is almost no infrastructure. Um, I mean, certainly in the major port cities, um, there might be, um, but around most of Spain, there is there is little or no uh, kind of traveler's in infrastructure. And I know that because in researching the 18th century book, by, by, the, by the 1770s, they are just now building that infrastructure. Kind of outside of the, you know, um, the pilgrimage to Santiago, which does, right, the Camino, that has its own infrastructure from medieval times, right? But getting around the rest of Spain is incredibly hard. And actually, I don't, I've never found any evidence 
I was looking, for instance, for a while at uh, women who travel quite long distances to do day agricultural labor, and they're going on their own, or they're going in groups of other women um, because they know who will hire them uh, to work in somebody's fields pretty far away, two, 300 kilometers away. Um, but this is not about, they are not in any way that I can see using any kind of an infrastructure. And when my, when the peasants that I study come from the interior of, of Spain to the coast, they all complain that there's absolutely no infrastructure. They're sleeping on the sides of the roads. Um, they don't have carts even to haul their stuff. Um, when children die, they're having to bury children alongside the road. There's, and these, and that's actually more or less in the region where the the Camino goes. And even then, by the, it, it as late as the 1780s, there's no significant in infrastructure. Excellent. We're going to oh. actually have to leave it there because oh, it has Katie, been. One over here. Oh, sorry. Okay, no, we're not. This was just a question or an observation for Michael. Um, I want to push back against the notion that this is hidden. I don't think it is. Like as much as it's in the humor magazines and in the newspapers that you're finding, I think it's hidden in the official archive. But I think this is part of a visual world. There are tens of thousands of postcards of harems that are from French Indochina in the same period. So. You've got photographers working inside these places, taking pictures, and then the interesting act of this is that it doesn't just stay, right, this bad behavior doesn't just stay in the colonies. The bad behavior is then sent to their friends in France. The English do this too. Like, and they share the bad behavior with them, not in an envelope, like in a postcard, and this stuff is traversing the mail in these vast networks. So there's like, tens of thousands of people who are seeing these images all over the world as they're floating back. I think it's lost for a while, you know, for certainly in the official archive. And I think even when they're in the neighborhoods with one another, it's not like no one else is seeing them. It's like they're being seen by all the other white men, but the other white men just don't care because they're also there. It would be the notion that like if the woman saw them, like in one of your cartoons, there's like a really sort of mad, very white, all in white woman, like looking at him as he sails away. That, uh, that gaze I think is challenging, but I think that this stuff is so commonplace and that the, the new and interesting part about this is, is mapping the where now because that's lost. But I wouldn't be surprised if you found somewhere some maps of this from the time period because it was so common. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I mean, those, are, those are all great points, and I, and I, I agree with all your, your subtleties there. Um, the, the, the postcards um, are unreliable, and there's a, there's a fantastic book on these postcards for Algeria by Malik Alula, the colonial harem, and those, the, the women that are being depicted in there, are, it's supposed to look like uh, ethnic, uh, uh, sort of like, different examples of different Berber groups or so forth. But anybody who knows anything about what they're wearing is it's just some photographer grabbing a bunch of stuff and throwing it on these women and making up these outfits. So they're, yeah, yeah. So they're, so they're in that, in that regard, they're, they're, those are sort of unreliable. And the postcards that I have, I can't really place them in parts of the city. Um, and the, the, that their prostitutes is implied. It's oftentimes not listed um, on the postcards. You know, it says uh, Vietnamese woman, but she's got no top on and she's got an opium pipe. I mean, you, you know what's going on, but it's not as laid out. Whereas these sources actually really lay things out and allow for a mapping in the city. All right, think we're going to have to leave it there because I want to respect um, people's time and we're a little bit over time, but not as bad as it could have been. Um, I want to thank our speakers because they pointed out um, both what maps can show us, but also the silences that are inherent in them and that uh, certain identities are not revealed or respected in maps um, and that sometimes there needs to be challenges to those. That's a topic we're going to pick up tomorrow morning with our first session and throughout the day tomorrow. So I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow and otherwise have a great night. Thank you.
Uh, just so you know, uh, we are the first thing that happens tomorrow is actually at the Bender Room. It's uh, refreshments, coffee. Uh, and so uh, that's at 10.30 tomorrow. Just keep in mind that the library itself does not open till 10 on Saturdays here. So tomorrow, don't come before 10. Um, and uh, we will, uh, we'll, there'll, there'll be somebody over here at 10.30, but the, um, the, uh, the refreshments are upstairs. Uh, so the best way, easiest way to get there is to take the elevator. When you come in from the Bing Wing, just take, up, take it up to the fifth, fifth floor. And then we'll start our first session here at uh, 11 o'clock. And uh, we will probably uh, we'll be open for another 20 minutes or so, 5.30. So it's a, probably an opportunity for you to uh, look at the exhibition that's around you and also downstairs. Uh, these are all uh, curated. Um, the, the content and the curation is from all the speakers. Um, and uh, so that's, um, you know, this is going to stay on for another six months, um, and then we'll put it online. So uh, I um, definitely do that. And I also want to, uh, some of you will not uh, be here tomorrow, so I want to acknowledge uh, Jira Fazel over here. This is her last exhibition. Uh, she uh, uh, mounted the exhibition, so uh, 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 give her a round of applause, please. <laughs> And also, um, all the many people who've helped uh, put this together, uh, TJ Crisada over there, the back, uh, the operations manager. Uh, Rayon Wang, she helped uh, with lots of things, but also the, very much the exhibition, so that's great. <laughs> Bryn at the back there, today, tomorrow, you know. Uh, <laughs> Yes, uh, so, so, and of course, Katie Parker. Thank you.